Personality disorder is usually somebody who doesn't quite know who they are as a person. Oftentimes I have trouble figuring out what I like, what I don't like. It's a lot of black and white thinking versus shades of gray. Um, it's kind of like being on a teeter-totter every single day. You're either one thing or you're another thing, but there's no happy middle place in between. That's my best description of a personality disorder. I found out that I had a personality disorder through many years of working with a therapist and a psychiatrist. What led to that was I had a suicide attempt about four or five years ago now, and I had a few others besides that afterwards, and it felt like you're breaking from the inside out, that there's always an empty hole, that there's something in you that isn't filled or you can't fill it. And for me, it was, I went years trying to fill that void with things that were not the healthiest. And eventually I just wanted to give up. And that was when that was the big clue that something was wrong, something needed to get fixed or something needed to happen. It's more common than people would think. It's one of those things where there's actually several categories of personality disorders and it, they're often disguised as something similar like bipolar or often depression or anxiety will also be mixed in there so it's not easy it's not easy to diagnose and a lot of times especially for me i had a hard time keeping a therapist and a psychiatrist and it was really hard to diagnose it until I got the right diagnosis. And they were like, well, these are the best steps that you can take if you choose to take them. And if this is the diagnosis that you think you agree with. Um, but it's often disguised as other things. And a lot of times people don't know it until you've had therapy for a long time. Um, in therapy, what we work on for personality disorder is we usually work on emotion regulation, how to live with your emotions, how to deal with more than one emotion at a time, um, learning to think in colors of gray, not just black and white, um, open communication. Um, the biggest class that I took during this time was dialectical behavioral therapy, or DBT for short and that helped the most. It's kind of a long class and it takes a long time to get through, so usually you end up taking it more than once, but that definitely helps regulate and helps you learn more about your emotions. It helps you learn more about how to deal with how you're feeling and what are good outlets and healthy outlets to work with that. What DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy looks like is you're often in class with other people. You get a very big handbook and it's a lot of worksheets and it's a lot of talking and working with therapists who are trained in how to do DBT. And you often are and you often end up around a table together and you do a lot of talking and communicating with other people about what you're feeling, about um their feelings, how you would communicate that, how you live with that, how you would walk yourself through that. And the classes usually run the entire day, so it's almost like being at school all over again. Things that were supportive were, they were there. Um, at first, I don't think they really believed that there was a big issue until four or five years ago and then I think they realized there was a big issue there and I still think that they have a hard time recognizing it. I think the stages of grief often come into play when you when someone you know gets diagnosed with a mental health condition and um, but they were there they 
were supportive. They were around. Um, I think they still have a hard time with everything that led to it, but they're, they've gotten easier to communicate with over the years. Personally, mine tends to be risky behavior. I've gone skydiving just because I wanted to. Um, a lot of times there's risky behaviors, and so I'll let that be whatever, whoever's watching this, let that be whatever risky behavior they think it is. Because oftentimes it's drinking, it's drugs, it's sex, it's something. And there's usually risky behaviors because you don't want to feel what you're feeling. You don't want to feel anything at all. You want to feel something completely different or just nothing. And oftentimes those risky behaviors give you a dose of adrenaline, a dose of serotonin, a dose of dopamine, and they give you that little high that you're looking for. Um, so you don't have to feel the emotions that you're supposed to be feeling. Most likely my, since I was a teenager, probably about 14 or 15 it started around 14 or 15. And then it kind of just over years and years of lack of therapy, lack of getting help, lack of wanting to address it because of just being afraid, it kind of just stockpiled and got worse and worse over time. As a younger person, it I think people think you're going through a phase. I think people think that oh, they're just a teenager, they're doing teenage stuff, or they're rebelling, or they're acting out because of this way, or they're really quiet because of that way, or, or I was teased really badly as a teenager and as a, even as an adult to a point. Um, and so it was like, well, she must be that way because people pick on her or she's a heavier kid. So that's why she must do the things that she does. And oftentimes it gets swept under the rug um, as it evolves into an adult. You don't start realizing that these quirks or these things that people just said you were typical teenager stuff haven't like gone away by the time you're 25 or 26. Then you start to think, well, these should have fixed themselves or should have grown out of these, but I haven't yet. And they're still around. Like I said, risky behaviors or you're just quiet or oftentimes um, people take, take you as like a rebellious teen if you're doing things and breaking rules or they take you as the quiet, introverted teenager oftentimes whether you, you just don't say anything or you don't talk much when the reality is you're thinking a lot and things like things like that change and develop and when you become an adult i do take medication it helps kind of helps me sleep at night, helps me stay asleep. Sleeping is a huge part. If I get sleep deprived, things get really rough. I um, do take other medication. Off the top of my head, I can't remember what it is, but it took a long time to find the right medication since everybody's different and everybody functions differently. It took, it took up until this last year to find a medication that really worked well for myself. And I, so I do take medication. I was, I did outpatient therapy. I did inpatient therapy. Now I see a therapist and a psychiatrist on a regular basis. And that's where my, where I'm at. It used to be hard to hold jobs. It used to be hard to relate to my kids but it's gotten better over time. The more I learn about my own emotions and how to connect more to myself, the more I'm able to connect to my kids and the better I'm able to maintain and hold a job 
which the job I have now I really enjoy and I think that I do well at it and I've been in it for quite some time now which has been really nice. I'm hoping for myself that I can maintain being in recovery and then if I do slip off the recovery wagon as people call it that I'm able to realize it or listen to the people who see it and be able to get the help that I need to get. That's what I'm hoping for at this point. If you want to support somebody who might have a personality disorder or any kind of mental health, just really be willing to listen. Listen to listen, not listen to talk listen to give them an ear say I'm here for you if you need me sometimes it's simply just hearing that that makes a huge difference um, in how my day plays is having somebody who's like hey do you want to talk for a few minutes and you're like yeah that would be great sometimes it's as simple as just saying have a nice day or I'm thinking of you just being there being willing to have that connection. There are things that when you start telling me how I should be handling my own therapy or my own recovery, um, everyone has an opinion and that is fine. And I think that everybody goes to recovery differently than everybody else. For me, it's baby steps. Like you can't just tell me to make a drastic change. For me, it's gotta be one small step at a time. So it's definitely not helpful when you start pushing your opinions and pushing things on to somebody who's already stressed out and frustrated with life most days in general. If you're listening to this and you're struggling, know that there is help out there, that you're not alone. My biggest battle was feeling like I was the only person in this world that, and I was by myself. And that's not true. There are people out there. There are people who specialize in this. There are people who know how you're feeling, whether you think there is or not. There are definitely people that are out there to help and out there to help you get re into recovery, whether it's from substance abuse or mental health, or anything that goes with a personality disorder. I really don't think there's a way to recognize unless you've been trained. I don't think there really is a way to recognize it that you can recognize the small portions of parts of it like the anxiety, the depression, the paranoia. You can recognize small little tidbits, but as a whole, I think you have to be a trained clinician to be able to recognize a personality disorder as a whole. A personality disorder is more like one big puzzle and having little pieces inside that they match up, they're just not put together right. Multiple personalities, do you have multiple personalities? In this case, I have a personality, it's kind of my own, but it's more broken or shattered. It's kind of like a mirror that's been broken and so it has a bunch of web, has webs in it, but it's not completely like a part. A relapse for me is usually my anxiety gets really high, my depression gets really bad, my eating disorder portion will kick in and I won't eat as much. I'll do a lot of over-exercising or over-indulging in eating. One of the two, usually it's the first, the first is the second. But it's little tiny things that's taken years to realize, okay, my anxiety is really high today. It's been really high the last few days. I need to schedule something with my therapist or my depression's been really bad lately. I need to talk to my therapist because for the last week it's been really bad or 
just acknowledging there are certain things that there are certain triggers there are certain there are certain um slips that you can kind of see once you've practiced enough to be able to see it another way to describe the personality disorder is the yin yang symbol it's black and white there is no middle ground. It's just, it's you're either in the dark or you're in the light. It's one or the other. Um, you usually feel like a mess, but you don't know how to describe what being a mess is like. It's like walking into a room and it's a messy room, but it's not like a disaster. So you kind of leave it that way, but there's an uncomfortableness. It's an unsettled feeling. therapy it's especially the dbt therapy they help you kind of with your emotions identifying your emotions being able to sit with your emotions knowing that emotions are like roller coasters they come and they go in waves and that what goes up will come back down and being able to regulate those emotions as well and giving you tools and tips on how to do that get diagnosed with a personality disorder you have to meet certain characteristics for a certain period of time if you look at the DSM and you look under personality disorder they have diagnostic diagnostics that you meet certain criteria and oftentimes you have to meet so many out of a list and then they'll consider you having it and after time they'll reevaluate and re-talk to their own peers and they'll you often be working with a team of people who will be kind of working on is this the diagnosis they should have or is this the diagnosis they shouldn't have some examples of those characteristics are risky behaviors or depression or anxiety a combination of all of the above, having it for so much time, um, and really, it's really up to you and your doctor and talking about how you feel about the diagnosis that you get, and really having an open communication with your doctor about that. It's kind of your emotions are all over the place. Like you can go from zero to one eighty in. 30 seconds like you can go from being perfectly calm to being super frustrated and angry and not even really be sure why and um, and you're not sure how to deal with that emotion so usually that's when like a risky behavior or something or a temper tantrum or whatever you like to call it usually comes out Borderline personality disorder is an illness marked by ongoing pattern of varying moods. These individuals really struggle with self-image and high-risk behavioral concerns. Uh, impulsive behaviors and relationship instability are often consequences of these problems. Diagnostically, Personality disorders are organized into three different groups or clusters. Cluster A disorders are characterized by more odd or eccentric behaviors in which uh, individuals are seen, perceived more as peculiar, suspicious, or detached. Individuals with cluster B disorders are characterized more so by traumatic or erratic behavior. These individuals tend to experience very intense emotions engage in extremely impulsive, theatrical, or law-breaking behaviors. And this is where borderline personality disorder is found within the cluster B group. Um, these individuals are most known uh, by their instability in relationships and, and their extreme problems with emotion regulation. 
And that third cluster, which is cluster three, those individuals struggle more with pervasive anxiety and fearfulness. So what's really important to remember is that we're all human beings and we all have personalities. The difference between disordered and non-disordered tendencies lies within one's ability to engage in healthy and trusting relationships where less disruptions are present. Symptoms of borderline personality may include unstable self-image, inconsistencies in one view, how one views their values, their goals, or their appearances. Uh, they have difficulties empathizing with others. Uh, they may come across as very insensitive. Uh, they have a hard time relating with others. They may come across as more detached at times or other times very needy of your attention and your support. Um, dangerous or high-risk behaviors are often present and, and much of concern within treatment. Um, these individuals see things as more so in extreme ways where it's either all or nothing. Whereas one day they might see you as your very best friend and really enjoy spending time with you and the next day they might see you as a traitor and be angry and resentful and, and not want to talk to you. Another uh, very common characteristic of individuals with borderline personality disorder is that they have these intense feelings and fears of abandonment. So with borderline personality disorder, research has found that about 1.6% of the population in the United States suffers from this disorder. Um, nearly 75% of these individuals are found to be as women. Uh, some do question though if men are, are more often misdiagnosed with disorders such as PTSD instead of borderline personality disorder. Treatment for individuals with borderline personality disorder um, are often uh, based off of cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy interventions. Uh, these are evidence-based practices that focus on helping individuals identify unhealthy schemas or, or thoughts and beliefs um, and also reinforce use of coping skills to help them better regulate their emotions, reduce those self-destructive behaviors, and improve relationships. Many of these individuals also receive medication management services, um, and medications really help to promote mood stability, reduce anxiety, and, and other problems um, that are related to co-occurring disorders that, that many individuals with borderline personality disorder might have. And common co-occurring disorders could be major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, or substance use disorders of any type. To differentiate between the different types of disorders, it can be pretty complicated. Um, and so what we really look at is, is the relationship and stability that happens and the impulsivity that comes along with borderline personality disorder. Those are kind of hallmarks of it. Um, just lots of changes in relationships and, and um, high risk concerns that happen with these individuals. And when a person uh, with borderline disorder uh, experiences emotions, they happen very hard and very fast, very intensely. And, and that's where the impulsivity comes in. And we don't see that quite as often with people who don't have it. So those with major depression disorder, it's more of a, the mood is more stable with the lowness and you don't see the, the fluctuation in mood and the reactivity that you would with someone who suffers from borderline personality disorder. Impulsive high-risk behaviors that, 
that are most concerning in treatment um, that individuals with borderline personality disorder present with um, it would be suicidality. Uh, individuals who are either persistently thinking about or have made attempts to die by suicide. Um, there's the self-harming behaviors that can come with that. Um, the, the substance use, uh, where you might see some binge drinking or high-risk drug use, um, things like that where there's little concern for, for, for the safety or the care of the individual. It's more so of really desperately looking for a way to not feel the way that they're feeling. Impulsive behaviors can really vary depending on any day and any moment with an individual with borderline personality disorder. Um, for instance, they might be in a really great mood and they might be shopping at the store and they might see a shirt that looks great and love it and buy it and feel really great about that. And then once they get home, they might realize that they didn't have the money for that shirt or the intention to go to that store was to buy groceries for the household and then the intense feelings of of regret and um, self-hate might occur from there so uh, it, it varies day to day moment by moment of, of what those impulsive behaviors might look like depending on the mood they're in that day or how severely they're struggling with their symptoms Cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on helping individuals identify how their thoughts and beliefs affect how they feel and then how they behave um, on any given day, in any given moment. Um, that, that cycle of thinking, feeling, behavior happens to all of us all day long. Um, dialectical behavioral therapy is a treatment modality that focuses primarily on dialectics or a scene that two things can be true at the same time. So, um, you know, for instance, with individuals with borderline personality disorder, um, they, they think and they feel in extremes of it's either one way or the other. You're either good or bad. I love you, I hate you. I need you, I don't wanna see you anymore. Or dialectics helps people see that, that two things can be true at the same time. It doesn't need to be one thing or the other. Treatment episodes can vary uh, for individuals. Um, oftentimes individuals with borderline personality disorder really struggle to develop trust and relationships with others. And that includes providers as well. Um, so having difficulties with trust is a barrier to engagement in treatment. And then also, um, sometimes people come to treatment and they just want to get better within a session or two. And, and it's a lot of work um, when, when someone has a severe disorder. Um, and so when people don't get better as fast as they would like to, they might become very frustrated. Uh, with their treatment attempts and then which reinforces their hopelessness and engagement in the higher risk behaviors and, and relationship problems instead of staying within treatment and, and learning strategies to manage those problems. Evidence shows that individuals with borderline personality disorder benefit most from structured and highly intensive outpatient treatment. Um, and so within most um, dialectical behavioral therapy programs, individuals are encouraged to make a commitment of at least one year to engage in that intensive treatment program. Whereas some people might be attending group weekly and then having individuals with their primary therapist at least weekly or, or sometimes twice a month, depending on how they're doing. Um, whereas others might have uh, group interventions be even more frequent than that. Um, and then after that, that your commitment to treatment, ongoing maintenance therapy can also be very important to help individuals address problems as they occur to reduce the risk of relapse. And so the frequency of, of treatment would be 
much less often, yet the engagement in that relationship is important. Healthy practices for someone with uh, borderline personality disorder would be similar to anyone else, honestly. Um, really developing a good foundation for self-care is so important. Um, engaging in relaxation and mindfulness activities and engaging in supportive and healthy relationships. Avoiding mood altering substances is very important too. Being an attentive listener, validating emotional experiences, and modeling healthy boundaries are so important in, in means to support an individual with borderline personality disorder. They need to know that you're there for them, that you're gonna be consistently there for them, yet you also need to have pretty clear boundaries, um, and that's as a means of self-care for yourself as well. Um, whereas individuals with borderline personality disorder can be very, needy at times um, and for you to have boundaries is going to be important to, to reduce the amount of strain on the relationship. So some examples of boundaries that you might need to set um, in a relationship with a person who experiences problems with BPD would be, for example, times of the night that they can call you. Um, individuals may be up at all times of the night and, and distressed about problems and, and could call frequently throughout the night if their emotions are very intense. Um, and so you may need to set some boundaries and say, hey, I'm here for you, but please uh, don't call me between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. At those times, I really need you to call the crisis response team if you need someone to hear you and listen to you. Um, other boundaries in regards to safety might be that um, you will be friends with and you will spend time with the individual, but you will not spend time with the individual if they're drinking alcohol, if alcohol is a high risk behavior for them. So as a support person of someone with borderline personality disorder, you may want to consider some counseling for yourself. Um, it can be very, very emotionally um, taxing to be in a relationship with someone who struggles so intensely with, with your emotions and varying moods. Um, so it's helpful to have some support for yourself um, to learn how to, to manage that stress in the relationship and to learn some effective communication strategies and how to set supportive yet uh, important boundaries with individuals with, beat, with uh, borderline personality disorder. Um, if you are concerned about a loved one and would like to suggest professional help, um, first, it's really important to describe what your concerns are while you're also validating their, their emotional experience to the concerns and then making the request that they get help. Um, an example might be that you'd say, I'm just really concerned about you right now. I've noticed you're under an immense amount of stress. Your moods have been more up and down. Uh, you've been drinking more and you've missed work. It seems like you have a lot going on and I think it'd be helpful for you to talk to someone about it. I wouldn't recommend um, pointing out that a person might struggle with borderline personality disorder. I think in general, as human beings, we don't enjoy being labeled. And for, there is so much stigma behind this disorder that that may make things worse. I guess what I would suggest if you are questioning if someone might have these struggles, is, is, like I said, just be supportive, be a good listener, point out your concerns, and suggest that they get some help to learn how to manage their emotions a little bit better so that they can have 
so that they can be more in control of their life versus their emotions being in charge of them. If you're noticing that a loved one is engaged in treatment, but the treatment seems to be primarily focused on supportive strategies versus um, really putting the onus on the individual to learn how to manage their emotions better. So really that, that intensive treatment to, to learn effective strategies to cope and for them to be in control of their emotions. I think it's really important for them to find professionals who are trained in, uh, in treating individuals with borderline personality disorder. Um, so you may want to look for a provider who has training in uh, dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, that is the modality that is very commonly used and found to be very effective in treating the disorder. Having a, a, a trusting, supportive relationship with, with a provider is so very important. Um, and if you're concerned that your loved one has that relationship yet is, is not getting better at the same time, I think that'd be okay to say, you know, validate the relationship and say, hey, Erica, I know you really love to see Dr. So-and-so and she's such a great listener to you. And I wonder, you know, what are some coping skills that you're learning to, so that you can manage your emotions better? And if that individual isn't able to identify ways that they can take some ownership of and, and learn how to control those thoughts and emotions better, then that would be an opportunity for you to say, well, hey, I wonder if there's someone out there who might be able to teach you these things so that you can be in better control of your emotions. Um, so it's, it's this very careful conversation that we would we would want to have where we don't want to invalidate that relationship with the provider that they may really enjoy. Um, yet with the dialectical balance, it's also saying, and we want you to learn ways that you can be in more control. And there might be other people who can help you with that too. When you're speaking with an individual who is really experiencing in intense emotions is in, is under a high level of stress in the moment. What is so important to do is, is to validate those emotions and say, oh my gosh, you are so stressed right now. And it makes sense that you are so stressed right now with all of these things happening in your life right now. Yeah, I would be stressed too. And, and I would feel overwhelmed and anxious and oh my gosh, you must be exhausted. What can we do to try to make these things be less intense? How can I help you? Are there, are there some things that we could do a little bit differently for, for one situation? Do we need to take a little break and, and practice some mindfulness? And so that, that coaching into coping skills after validating the intensity of their emotions is important. Um, when we tell people that that their feelings are bigger than they should be or they shouldn't feel that way or, or really it's not that bad you should feel that way it's not that bad uh, these statements are so invalidating and it makes the person feel misunderstood it makes you feel like it makes them feel like you might not care and and it gives them evidence that they are defective and they already feel like they are because they're in, their emotions just get to be out of control and they know it and it is painful and they wish it wasn't that way, but it is. Um, and so when we give them evidence by making those statements, uh, it increases their instability in their self image, which just continues this cycle of self judgment and intense emotions. So it's so important to validate how they feel because their feelings, they are true to them. That is how they feel and then we need to ask, how can I help? So when you're in a supportive relationship with someone, um, 
and you're doing your best. You are doing your best to try to help them out, but you know that with what you know, it's not enough. Be honest with them and say, I care about you so much. I see that you are so stressed and your emotions are so intense and they get out of control and then you get so tired and I wish I could help you better. I really do, but I, I can't, I just don't, I don't know how to, but I do know that there are people out there who are really good at this and they know how to be helpful and they they know lots of skills that they can teach you. And, and there are other people too that you can be with in group and talk about your experiences and talk about strategies that do work when, when emotions are so big and out of control. When, when you're really trying to encourage a loved one to get necessary help to treat the disorder or the illness, uh, oftentimes they will present barriers to you. I don't have the time for that. I don't have the money for that. I don't want to sit down and talk about my problems. I think it's so important um, to remind that loved one that this is a problem that has become a part of their biology. Uh, the sensitivity is something that they were born with and also reinforced um, in their in their environments in their early years. You know, if they were in um, households where uh, there was a bit of chaos or it was an invalidating environment, um, this has become a part of them just as for some people, diabetes becomes a part of them and their biology. And, you know, if this person had diabetes, of course they're going to get the medication to treat that. And of course they're going to work on strategies to, um, to change their diet so that the problem is less bad. And so when you get that resistance, it's important to, to remind them that this isn't something that just goes away and it can make life a lot worse. They're tired and things are feeling out of control and, and they gotta be willing to put in the time and, and, and the resources to get better so that life feels more worth living. You know, for, for individuals who struggle with, with borderline personality disorder, that, that self-concept is so poor and, and they forget that they're worth worth the help they're worth the time with other individuals to get better and to learn strategies to manage things in a way where they're feeling more in control of their life um, treatment is very effective when it's sought out and individuals are engaged and i i so enjoy working with individuals who who struggle with this disorder because when I can be that person to to offer that sense of hope, when I can be that person to say, you know what, I get it. I get why this is so hard for you. And I get why your feelings come so hard and fast. And it's, your, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault that you went through these things and these things happened to you. But it, it's time. Those things have happened to you. And now we're going to take your life back. And you're going to be in charge and you're gonna do your best and we're gonna work with you and help you get through this. Because why not? Why not? We can make life better, so let's do that.